Welcome to the Link Church podcast channel. You're about to hear a message from Pastor Tony Rainbow from Victory Church in Adelaide, Australia. In life, stuff happens, and when it does, you've got to know how to get back up again, to endure and press on despite difficult circumstances. Thank you for joining into today's podcast. Why don't you lean in and be inspired by a word from God? Thank you. How's everyone doing? You good? Who's excited about tonight? Fantastic. I am, and I just want to say a massive thank you to this incredible couple on the front row here. You have incredible leaders. Do you know that? Can we just put our hands together for your leaders? They're amazing. Don't ever take them for granted. I believe the death nail to every local church is when we get so familiar that we take one another for granted. You have incredible leaders. Love on them and honour them ongoingly. Amen. Fantastic. Well, in my short time that I have tonight, I want to get straight into it because I have a message that I want to encourage you with. And it's simply entitled, if you're taking notes, I don't know if you do that here, but I want to encourage you to write this down. You got this. Say it after me. You got this. And that's going to make a whole heap of sense as we continue the message today. And I want to delve straight into the Word of God right now. And if you would turn with me to Philippians chapter 4 and verses 10 to 13. We're going to be reading. I think the Scriptures will come up on the screen. But uh, this is Paul speaking from a prison cell. And he says this, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I have am in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every circumstance, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. And then it says, the famous verse, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Who's mindful of that verse? Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You know, that is one of the most well-known verses in the Bible. Unfortunately, not only is it one of the most well-known verses, but it's almost one of the most misused verses. People have taken it out of context and used it for their personal gain and used it to make outlandish comments that they can do all kinds of things. Like, I can dunk a basketball. But I want you to know that's not really true because I'm too short and I'm too white. I can't dunk a ball. (laughs) And when we move from faith to presumption, we distort the Word of God and we realize that actually maybe God wasn't saying that and then we get despondent and discouraged and then we give up on the Word of God. And so I want to put this uh, Scripture in its proper context to encourage us all that no matter what you're going through, God is with us. Amen? Amen. It often gets used, this verse, as a license to do whatever you want, and uh, we want to change that today. In actual fact, the big theme of this particular portion of Scripture is not your comfort, and it's not a Scripture for your blessing, and it's not a promise that you'll get whatever you want, whenever you want, but it's actually a, a message about contentment, no matter what your circumstance, no matter what your situation, and no matter what you are presently going through. That's what this is all about. It's not about dreams coming true or goals being met, but it's about being joyful, satisfied and steadfast, even when it's hard and the circumstances seem impossible. And so if you're going through a tough time, if you're going through a difficult season, you're in the right place tonight because I have a word to encourage you. And so there's a few things I want to draw from this passage of Scripture tonight that I believe Paul is wanting us to understand and to live in. When we understand this verse in its proper context, it's going to lead to some things in your life. And I've got three of them tonight. Do you want to know what they are? Fantastic. Number one, when we understand this verse in its proper context, it's going to lead to endurance. Everyone say endurance. Paul says, I know what it is to be well fed and I know what it is to be hungry. I know what it is to have plenty and I know what it is to have nothing. And so Paul is saying, I can do all things. And what he's really saying is I can endure all things. Whether I have lots or whether I have nothing, I can endure all things. In other words, I don't have to give up and I don't have to give in. Paul is saying, not that we shouldn't dream bigger dreams, but he's reminding us 
that we can endure the crushing feeling of defeat even when those dreams are not realized. And so maybe that girl that you had your eye on and you thought you were going to get married and she was not interested in you, that crushing feeling of defeat in your life, Paul is saying, hey, don't give up. You can endure. There are plenty more fish in the sea. Amen. And so Paul is not, uh, not encouraging us not to go out and conquer the world, but he's reminding us that we can press on even when the world conquers us. In actual fact, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, he goes on to say, Not that I have already obtained all of these things, and nor have I already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ took a hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but the one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You know, I don't know what your year looked like last year. I don't know what you're presently facing. But Paul was facing a tough moment in his life. And this is what he said. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind, I press on. And Link Church, I want to encourage you to press on. Your best days are ahead of you. Whatever you've experienced in the past, be it good, bad or indifferent, your best days are ahead of you. And so we need to press on in order to embrace that which Paul, uh, God has called us to and Paul is highlighting in these scriptures. I heard this quote that says, you don't determine your greatness by your talent or wealth as the world does, but rather by what it takes to discourage you and make you quit. You're only as great as what it takes to make you quit. You know, I don't know about you, but 2016 for the rainbows, you know that promise that God gave that uh, your pastor was talking about? But for us, it was a strange year to say the least. And uh, I know for our church, it was an unusual year. In actual fact, for many people in Australia, it was a crazy year. In actual fact, the media picked up on that and they called it the curse of 2016. I don't know what it was like for you in South Africa, but uh, was it maybe just a little bit unusual, maybe a little bit difficult, and maybe you were like me and you just couldn't wait to see the back end of 2016. And so on New Year's Eve of 2016, we said goodbye, good riddance, welcome 2017. Anyone like that this year? Because we were certainly like that because of the incredible year that it was. Hey, don't get me wrong, we started really excited. I did what every good pastor does on January 1, 2016. I got all excited and I started prophesying great things ahead. This was going to be our best year. This was going to be our biggest year. This was going to be the year we experienced more growth than ever before. And we were bright-eyed and we were bushy-tailed and we were excited and we were believing for the best. And then our young people went to Summerfest, which is our summer camp. And on January 22nd, when they were all out having their tribal wars on the Oval, our young people, this rain cloud rolled in. And that's unusual for us in Adelaide because that's the middle of our summer. And normally we're having, you know, 40 degrees and it's dry. There is no rain. And this rain cloud came in. And no sooner had it come that it went. It was just a short rainstorm. There were some uh, rolls of thunder, peals of thunder. There was a couple of lightning strikes, and it was gone. But in the meantime, two of our youth members were struck by lightning. One of them was my 20-year-old niece, and uh, she lives to tell the story. The lightning went in her thigh and came out her ankle. Her shoe was blown off, and it was just disintegrated. It's just amazing, but I thank God that my niece, who just celebrated her 21st birthday the other week, is alive and can tell the story. And the good news is she has superpowers now. <laughs> but there was another member of our youth team, our youth pastor, who was 39 years of age. He was also struck by lightning. And he died instantly on that oval. And as a pastor... We had to negotiate the pain and the loss. His wife is in our church. His four young children are in our church. 
And we had to navigate the pain and the grief, the personal grief of that particular situation. And I've got to be honest with you, it took the wind out of our sail. A kind of the January 1 prophecies became a distant memory. But we managed to get our wind and get back on our feet because life does knock the wind out of you from time to time. And so we thought, okay, we're getting through that. And, and to be honest, when someone dies like that, it is an ongoing work. And so we're still working through that to this day. But we did manage to move on from that moment, only to come to March. And in March, we were in Noosa just having a great time. Kath and I thought we would have a little bit of a break after the incredibly sad start to our year. And it was in Noosa that Kath found lumps where there shouldn't be lumps. And so we had to go to the doctor, and so that's an ongoing process right now. And so that was in March, as my wife was now having some health problems. And so that took the wind out of us, but we got back up again. And we thought, you know what? It's going to be okay. And then in April, our 16-year-old son, he broke an arm. And you might say, well, that doesn't really compare to the other two. And it doesn't. But what you need to know about our son is that when he was younger, we prophesied that he would never break an arm. And do you want to know why we were so confident that he would never break an arm? Because he always landed on his head. <laughs> and so we said, ah, at least he'll never break an arm. But in April of 2016, what a blessed year it was. Mitchie broke his arm. So it's another trip to the hospital. And that knocked the wind out of our sails to a lesser degree, granted, but still, it was something we didn't really want to deal with, but we had to. But, you know, now we're going to get some traction. And then in May, I got a blood infection. And I was in hospital for not one week, not two weeks, but three weeks. And if any of you who know me, and that's not many here, but what you need to know is I'm kind of hyperactive. I have ADD, ADHD, LMNOP. I have every letter of the alphabet. I do. <laughs> and so to be in hospital for three weeks, having every part of my being checked and double-checked and triple-checked and poked and prodded, oh my goodness me, I've been poked and prodded. And... It was so severe. I said to the doctor in the middle of our time in hospital, I said, Doc, I, I feel like my body's shutting down. I don't know if you remember that, Craig, but that was about the time when you rang, and I, I was at my weakest. And the doctor says, it's because your body is shutting down. And there was two incredibly dark days for me in hospital. And I felt like I was dying. And I had all these dark thoughts. And this is one of the thoughts that went through my head. Oh my goodness me, our youth pastor died in January. I'm going to die. <laughs> You're laughing, that's terrible. <laughs> that's horrible. <laughs> but I did, I'm thinking, I'm going to die. Then I'm thinking this, I had this thought. Oh my goodness me, who's going to look after the church? Who's going to want to pastor Victory Church when all the pastors are dying? <laughs> Again, you're laughing at my pain. But that was a very real thought that I had to negotiate when I'm lying there in hospital. And then I managed to get through that. And because of all the checking, poking and prodding, they found a problem with one of my heart valves. My mitral valve had been damaged because of the severity of the blood infection. And they said, you need to have surgery. And so in September, I was on the operating table having open heart surgery. And that was my year. And a little unusual, to say the least. But to that I say this. Stuff happens. And when stuff happens to you, you've got to know how to get back up again. And what I like about what Paul is writing here, he's not writing from the comfort of a five-star hotel. He's writing from a prison cell, having been beaten, bashed and bruised many times over. But here he is saying this one thing I do. I press on. And so I don't know what your year was like last year. 
I don't know what you're going through in 2017. But I, along with Paul, want to say this. Press on. Don't give up. Don't give in. You see, Christianity is not just about winning. But it's also learning how to lose victoriously. You see, when you know how to lose victoriously, you win on every occasion. When we're winning, we win. And when we're losing, we win because we have a mentality that says in Christ we win. I don't know if you've read the end of your Bibles, but it says that we win. And many times during that dark moment in hospital, I reminded myself of what I'm preaching to you tonight. This is what I preached to myself when I was in hospital, that in the end, we win. Paul is saying, hey, that you will not experience a life of comfort so much as you will experience a life of victory, even in your losses. And we can win on every occasion when you know how to win in your losses. So can I say this? Don't be quick to quit. Don't run, but stay your course. Three years ago, our family had an addition because we decided to buy a puppy. And it was at the constant asking of our then seven-year-old daughter. She wanted a puppy. And so then I said, okay, when I realized that she could not be dissuaded, I thought, okay, we'll get a dog, but at least we'll get a, a dog that I like, a manly dog. But she would have no bar of a manly dog. She wanted a little white fluffy thing. A Maltese Shih Tzu. And I'm a dad, and so you give the daughter what she wants. But I thought, if we're going to get a girly dog, at least I'm going to get a male dog. And so we got a male Maltese Shih Tzu. But I soon realized there is no such thing as female or male when it comes to Maltese Shih Tzus. They're still a girly dog. And walking that little dog really dents your pride. It's God's way of keeping me humble, I'm sure. But I did what every good new dog owner does. And I thought I'm going to teach it what it needs to know. The essential in puppy ownership. And that is to get your dog to stay. And I was told to have some dog biscuits at the ready and to get down to their level. And when you've got a Maltese Shih Tzu, it's like really low. <laughs> and I, I would get this little dog to say, stay. And then they, t- they told me that if you have some rewards and move one foot away at a time and then reward it every time it stays, that's the way to teach it. And so I, I would start by saying, stay. And I'd go a foot away and, and, and I'd say, stay. But this dog, (laughs) this little girly, white, fluffy dog was just like, (laughs) and and, and, and it could never control itself. And before I knew it, it was just jumping on me, wanting all the biscuits. And and I found myself getting so frustrated. (laughs) And in my frustration, I felt God interrupt me and say this, Tony, you're like that. (laughs) You're laughing. But he went on to say, and my church is like that. So ha, 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 ha. (laughs) We're so busy wanting to go here and there. But I feel like God is saying in your pain and in your suffering and in your inability to comprehend what is going on, don't run, but stay. And the foundation of all things that are healthy is the ability to stay. You want a good marriage? You can't run off with the next person you see. You've got to stay in that marriage in order for it to be healthy and strong and to build that marriage. If you want a plant to be healthy, You can't just keep uprooting it. But it's got to stay in the soil and grow. And the Bible says those that are planted in the house of God, they will flourish. Not the ones that run here and run there and do this and do that like our little dog. (laughs) I know it can be boring at times and mundane, but I want to encourage you, Link Church, to not run, but to stay and to endure There's lots of unanswered questions 
in 2016 for me. I still don't have answers to some of the things that happened. But I don't have to have answers when the test is not to have answers, but just to trust God. And so don't give up. Don't give in. Winston Churchill said this when he was asked to speak at his old school in 1941. When he was speaking to these young men, he said this. Never give in. Never give in. Never, 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 in nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honour and good sense. Link church, endure. Don't give up. Don't give in. The second thing we can learn from Paul's letter is not only to endure, but the energy that comes to those that are in Christ. Paul says, I can do all things, but not because of his strength, not because of his wisdom, not because of his understanding, but he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In other words, Paul is saying, I have access to the supernatural power that energizes me for all things. See, what God wants to do to you and what God wants to do to me is add his super to our natural. You know, when I was a young boy, I used to uh, watch the cartoons and I used to get the comics with the superheroes in and my favorite superhero was Superman. Superman trumps every one of the other superheroes. I just want to say that right now. And what used to fascinate me about Superman is there was this guy called Clark Kent with his glasses, his suit, his tie, and he would go into a phone booth and a transformation would take place and he would come out not as Clark Kent, but he would come out as Superman. And it kind of gets me thinking, when we come into church, this church is like a big phone booth where we get transformed. We might come in like Clark Kent. We might come in with the busyness of the world and the busyness of work. But we come in and as we sit under the worship of God and as we sit under the Word of God, we get transformed. And we don't leave with our glasses, our suits, our shirt and our ties. We leave as supermen and superwomen able to take on the world. And I believe that's what takes place when we have our devotional times or our quiet times or our noisy times. But those times with God should transform us and change us when we are in the presence of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says this again, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. See, I think the grace of God is so amazing. The grace of God that is the unmerited favour. That God gives us what we don't deserve blows my mind. But grace is more than just unmerited favour. Grace is a supernatural enabling that empowers us to do what we otherwise could not do. I don't know if you're anything like me, but there are things in the Bible that I don't like. There are things that Jesus asks of me that I find really difficult to do. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are some things I love. They're real easy. But there are other ones that are hard, like, you know, love your enemies. I don't know about you, but my enemies are enemies for a reason, you know. They're not nice. It's easy to love those that love you, but the ones that aren't nice to you and the ones that are saying bad things about you, and Jesus is saying, I, I want you to love them. And if you're anything like me, that's impossible. Enter the grace of God. The grace of God gives us the ability to do what we otherwise could not do. And so Paul is in prison, but he's receiving a supernatural energy, not just to not give up, but to have an energy to write a letter to encourage other people. I love that thought. I love that thought that Paul is being energized supernaturally by the grace of God. Paul had a, what he called a thorn in the flesh. And the experts cannot agree what that thorn is. But 
I have a sneaking suspicion that that thorn was a people problem. Because there's no greater pain than people pain. Have you noticed that? I was in hospital and I experienced severe, excruciating physical pain. But I want to tell you, there's some people that have caused me far more pain than that. And Paul, three times, pleads, remove, remove, remove this thorn. It's like saying, get rid of that person, get rid of that person, get rid of that person. And if I'm honest, I've probably prayed that once or twice to some of the people in our church. (laughs) But God was silent for Paul and as he was silent to me when it came to that prayer. But then he says, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And at that moment, he was teaching us something that it's not the removal of the thorn that we need. It's the presence of of God's grace in our life. Because God's grace will change your perspective. See, sometimes our circumstances don't change. But the grace of God will change our perspective when our circumstances don't change. We have three incredible kids. Our oldest, her name is Jordan. She's 18. Our youngest is Bailey, affectionately known as BJ, and she's 10, going on 37. (laughs) And in the middle, we have my one and only son. His name is Mitchell, which means like God. He's my one and only son, which makes him like Jesus. And he's here, there, and everywhere, which makes him like the Holy Spirit. He's, (laughs) He's a great kid. But before he was born, and Kath was pregnant with Mitch, they picked up a problem with our child. They said the umbilical cord is not what it should be. His left hand is deformed. He has no fingers on his hand. And so we strongly advise you to terminate. I was so mad. I said, I'll go away and think about it. And what I meant was I just want to cool down. We came back a week later. We told the doctor we appreciated his perspective, but we want to continue with the pregnancy, to which he said we were being irresponsible parents which broke my heart, but we held our line. And Mitchie was born 40 weeks to the day. And the doctors were right. There was something wrong with the umbilical cord in his left hand. wasn't like his right hand. And I remember thinking to myself, there's going to come a day where this kid of mine is going to ask about his hand. And I was hoping it was like a thousand years from now. But when he was four, he was at kindy. And kids being kids, ask questions. And so Mitch came home from kindy one day, and he was quite downcast. And he said, Dad, why was I born with no fingers on my hand? And I've got to be honest with you, at that moment my heart broke. I didn't really know what to say. And so I said, the only thing I knew what to say and what that was, I don't know. And can I say to all the parents out there, if you don't have answers for your children, don't make something up to make yourself look like a hero. Because what took place after my honesty was amazing. I got this God drop. I said, Mitch, I don't know. And now I just got this God drop. I said, but I also don't know why you've got blonde hair. And I also don't know why you've got piercing blue eyes. And I also don't know why you're incredibly handsome. I said, Mitch, I don't know if you've noticed this, but there's a lot of ugly kids out there and you're not one of them. Isn't that awesome? And you know what? To this day, he's never asked me about his hand. He just walks around. Hi, ugly. How you doing, ugly? I got a photo I'd love to show you. This is our son a few weeks ago just leading worship. This is the guy the doctors wanted to terminate. And uh, there he is, leading worship, playing guitar. Incredibly handsome. And I put that up there not to say this is my son, but to say, hey, doctors, you were wrong. And I want to use it as a tool tonight to encourage you not to listen to the lie or the label that people have put on you. Because my son is not deformed. And he's not different. He's normal, whatever that is. 
Amen. And so this incredible grace that's available to us changes our perspective. And the third thing that I believe Paul is trying to highlight through this passage of Scripture is that of a need of enthusiasm. See, it's not about just hanging around and not giving up. But it's about having a passion for life. Paul says, I rejoice greatly. This amazes me. That here's Paul in prison and he says, I rejoice greatly. In other words, I can be enthusiastic in all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, the word enthusiasm is made up of two little Greek words, entheo, which means to be in God. And the Oxford Dictionary says that the word enthusiasm, it means to rave. You know, I often get told, Tony's just raving on. Yeah, I do. I rave on. I love Jesus. I'm sorry about that. I mean, come on. It means to go into raptures. And it also means to go overboard. Isn't it amazing that Peter was that disciple that was always enthusiastic, and he's the one that got out of the boat and went overboard when Jesus said, come. All the others stayed in the boat, but Peter went overboard. I think it's time that we at Link Church went a little bit overboard and raved on and had just a little bit of enthusiasm. Amen. Amen. Fantastic. Come on. Winston Churchill said this, success in life is often nothing more than going from one failure to the next with undiminished enthusiasm. I want to read as the band come up an extract from John Wesley's diary. John Wesley was an incredible reformer used by God in the 1700s. And uh, he was that man who wrote some 233 books. He preached over 50,000 sermons, raised 11,000 preachers, and through his ministry, one third of England was saved. And here's an extract from his diary. Sunday, May 5th, I preached at St. Anne's. I was asked not to come back. That night I preached at St. John's. I can't go back there. May 12th, I preached at St. Judas and I was not allowed to go there again. May 19, I preached at St. Paul's and I can't return. That night, I preached on the street and I was kicked off. May 26, I preached in a field and the farmer set his bull on me. June 2nd, I preached on the edge of town and I was kicked off the highway. But that night, I preached in the field and 10,000 people came to know Christ as their saviour. I often think, what would have happened if John Wesley had given up the day before? What would have happened if Paul had given up? But they didn't. This incredible God can strengthen you so that you endure. This incredible God can give you energy even in your darkest times. And this incredible God can give you a joy, enthusiasm, and a passion that you never thought possible, even in the darkest of moments. You see, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're experiencing, you got this. You got this. You don't have to run. You don't have to give up. You don't have to give in. You got this. Will you stand with me this evening?
You know, I know that tough times and dark times can hurt us exponentially. I know that people can be cruel and unkind and, and they can leave us broken hearted. But you know, when I was in hospital and that blood infection touched my heart, it left me quite literally broken hearted. And I could have laid there and said, Doctor, you don't know what you're talking about. But I realized that there was a problem and it needed fixing. And I realized at that moment I didn't have the skill. I didn't have the ability to fix my broken heart. And so I had to place my hands in the hands of another as he did his surgery on my heart to bring about that healing that I couldn't bring for myself. And I believe what I experienced physically is a picture of what God can do for us emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. The brokenheartedness we feel, the hurt and the pain we go through, is a pain that you can't deal with in and of yourself. It comes as we place our hands in the hands of another. As we place our hands in the hands of the greatest physician of all, his name is Jesus. And he can touch our heart. And he can heal our heart. And he can do a work in our lives that only he can do. I wonder if we could all close our eyes just for a moment in this place. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, just to minister your grace into every heart and into every life. I don't know what people's year was like last year or what it is like right now. But this I know you do. And it's my prayer that you'd make, meet every need and every person and every hurt. And I ask that right now in your precious name. Where people feel like they can't go on, where they feel like giving up, that you would strengthen, you would uphold, you would heal and you would reveal in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we ask that right now. If that's you, you're going through a tough time. You're just crying out for the grace of God. Can we just raise our hands to heaven right now? The Bible says that those that cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace of God that could be theirs. And so in order to receive the grace of God, we've got to let go of some things. We've got to let go of the hurt. We've got to let go of the pride. We've got to let go of the cynicism and the skepticism. And as we let go of that, God can come and bring what we need in this place. Because he's a faithful God. He's a powerful God. And he's the one who's able to help you endure. He's the one who's able to give you the energy and the enthusiasm to go on. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for your power.